here. Remember, tomorrow I will be hosting the Saturday Morning Talk is with Chris Rush as well. Have a great day. Hey everyone, this is Mitch Jezerich with Letters and Politics. Hope you are doing well at the end of the year and have a great idea for the beginning of KPFA, KPFB, and Berkeley KFC. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Welcome to today's edition of Terra Verde, a weekly environment program on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host, Nell Greenberg, here with my co-conspirator, Jason Mark. Tis the season for top ten lists. The year and holidays come with all sorts of traditions, among them magazines and websites, top ten lists of the year that was. In that spirit of looking back, today on Terra Verde, we'll be recalling some of the biggest environmental stories of 2013. From Yosemite's Rim Fire to Taifu Haiyan, from a GMO labeling ballot initiative in Washington State to President Obama's first speech dedicated to climate change, what were some of the events of 2013 that will have an impact beyond this calendar year? To reflect on 2013's top and untold stories, we have three prominent environmental reporters. Brian Walsh is the international senior editor and green blogger for Time Magazine. Kira Butler is the senior editor at Mother Jones. And Steve Hawk is the executive editor of, senior, of Sierra Magazine, published by the Sierra Club. Welcome to Terra Verde. Hi. Thank you. So, Brian, why don't we start with you? You recently put out your list of top ten environmental stories. And before we get into what those stories are, I'm curious how you even created that list. Well, you know, I would go back and I'd look at the stories that I wrote about over the course of the year. I mean, we have a, a blog, a, 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 and it's called Ecocentric on the website. So that's, you know, you're producing like a story a day, sometimes more often throughout the year. So you just kind of, I, I just actually looked and said, well, what was I writing over and over again? And so then I just sort of took a look through the news as well, talked to some people to get a sense as to what really over the last year seemed to be most important, seemed to be most influential in environmentalism and energy as well. And that's how we came up with it. But of course, every top 10 list is kind of a, a bit of a, a mismatch or what you personally think is important too. So what were some of the things you thought were important? Sure. I mean, you had mentioned, I think, the, the genetically modified food movement. And, you know, we had, um, you know, last year in California, 2012, this year Washington, uh, you know, anti-GMO activists really getting these labeling initiatives on the ballot, although it didn't work in Washington this year as well, to me was just sort of a sign that, you know, this, this, the food movement it does have political strength, has chosen to use it on this issue, and I think you'll see that come again and again. You saw, you know, the, the really rapid growth of rooftop solar, which I think is very important. You saw, you know, a story that actually has been there for several years in the Keystone XL pipeline, um, you know, and, and you're in California. We saw the, the you know, the launch of a cap-and-trade system of this, for the state, which I thought was was quite important, even though it's not something that got a lot of coverage, just because you know, this is one of the biggest economies by itself in the world. We'll see over the next number of years how a, 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 a sort of a carbon cap system works for California. I think that has a lot to do, or that will say a lot for the rest of the U.S. and the world as well. And, and Kara Butler, so you're the, one of the senior editors there at Mother Jones. I know one of your specialties is the environment. Um, what did you think were some of the biggest stories uh, in 2013? Well, there are so many to choose from. Um, one giant story was the IPCC report. Um, when we heard that 95% um, certainty has now been established that humans are causing uh, climate change. Um, another big story from that report was uh, something that skeptics seized on, which was this idea of the global warming pause. Um, and it was something that was uh, reported in um, a lot of media outlets as evidence that climate change was not happening. But um, as it turned out, uh, scientists were pretty um, positive that uh, the, that was not the case, that, that that had been misreported. So I would say that was, um, to my mind, the biggest story. And Steve Hawk, you're one of the editors there at Sierra Magazine, published by the Sierra Club. What, what do you think are some of the stories that, that are really going to have a lasting impact beyond this calendar year? Um, well, to 
me, the biggest one is the fact that uh, the United States has really um, turned away from coal. And it's actually, uh, I tend to think more optimistically. And I think that we've seen some, uh, kind of the birth of optimism in the environmental movement this year. You know, our carbon emissions have been rolled back to 1992 levels. That's partly because of what's happening with fracking and uh, the cost of natural gas going down. But, you know, the, um, the Sierra Club and other organizations have uh, gotten, um, have been able to shut down or have promised to shut down 158 coal fire power plants in the U.S. And that industry is basically um, in a in a permanent downward death spiral right now, I think. To me, that's the biggest story, because that's the one that's going to really last. And, Steve, I know that you guys have also put out a piece about um, the top good news sort of clean energy stories for 2013. Can you, I know that Brian sort of talked about rooftop solar, cap and trade in California. What else are we seeing that we can be happy about? Well, you know, um, California is... um, uh, has a renewable energy standard and is expected to get a third of its energy from renewable sources by 2020. And most people actually think that's going to be uh, 40% by then. Um, and to me, one of the biggest things that's happened is there's been, we, we're reaching a tipping point where the cost of solar and wind, particularly solar in the sunnier states, is now competitive with uh, dirty energy, with fossil fuel energy. And once that happens and the market takes over, um, the acceleration could be beyond what anybody really is able to predict or imagine at this point. You know, Kira, I, one of the biggest political stories of the year, just sort of regardless of the environment, was certainly the government shutdown in October. Um, I think it lasted, what, 17 days. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how did the government shutdown also have some kind of ripple and, and knock-on effects um, on the environment? There were some environmental dimensions of that story that got some attention, right? Uh, that's right. So one of the big um, pieces of fallout from that was the fact that um, research in the Antarctic actually uh, – some of the projects that were supposed to start during that time, because that's actually a really key time during the, those fall months of September and October, um, they didn't get to start those projects. Um, and they actually, that set them back enormously. And some of the most important research that's done today and climate is done down there. So I think we're going to be seeing, um, you know, less research coming out of there as a result of the shutdown. Interesting. So, I wonder if what you would say, Kira, just as a follow-up, how would you assess the Obama administration in 2013 when it comes to the environment? Um, that's a big question. Um, you know, there were certainly um, some positive moments. I think you guys mentioned um, the Obama's first speech on climate change, which was a, a huge moment. Um, and then there were also... Um, not so good moments. Um, I think we saw uh, a lot of um, setbacks in terms of um, meat rules. The Obama um, administration has recently um, announced that uh, poultry operations, for example, will um, be allowed to um, process more chickens with fewer inspectors, which is, um, to my mind, just a um, a huge setback to that industry. And Brian, what about you? How would you assess the environmental the environmental decisions of the Obama administration this year? Well, I'd say you know good intentions that didn't always uh, carry carry through. I mean, there was a, <clears throat> a report today in the Washington Post that noted you know in evidence that the Obama administration had delayed a uh, number of regulations, including environmental regulations, right before the 2012 uh, elections. Obviously, that was last year, but. You know, while there's, we had President Obama talk about climate change both in his, uh, in his inauguration speech and again in June, the big speech, uh, that sort of prefigured the climate change regulations that will be coming down the pike, uh, in the, in the years to come. At the same time, it, it, it never felt like a, a priority really. I mean, obviously there, you know, the, the, the government's under a lot of, uh, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. We had the shutdown, uh, which is going to do a lot of damage, I think, for energy as well. Um, but, you know, both this year and I think in past years, uh, you know, I, I would understand why environmentalists feel a little bit uh, unsatisfied with, with what the Obama administration has done. Um, although it's interesting the way that with this big Keystone XL decision, which will come 
presumably eventually, um, you've actually seen the the uh, it really the environmentalists actually I think change Obama's mind on something. It really does seem as if they pushed him to stopping this, which I think was definitely not the case, uh, you know, a few years ago. Yeah, I think that's an interesting part about what the big sto- what were the big stories of the year. You know, some of them are because of events like weather events. Some of them are because of decisions the administration makes. But some of the biggest stories come from the environmental movement itself. And would you say that Keystone is the sort of clear, shining story of 2014 when, or 2013 when it comes to the environmental movement? I think so. You know, I mean, obviously it's entirely possible that he could decide to let it go forward. It just seems more and more that that's not the way the signs are are looking. And this is really something you can chalk up, you know, I think to... 350.org, which has really made this a, a key issue. Bill McKibben has made this a key issue, and it, it shows that, you know, I mean, it, climate change and really, especially climate change, I think, is a very difficult uh, issue to in some ways mobilize action on because it's so diffuse. There's no one decision you can sort of point to and say, well, if we just do this, then we'll fix the problem. So that's always been a bit of a, a bit of challenge, I think, for, for activists. But here, you know, whatever you think of Keystone, they've, they've been very good at picking a very discreet issue really pushing it out there and I think ultimately affecting some political change along the way. And Steve, from your vantage point there within the Sierra Club, what do you think are some of the biggest, I guess you could sort of say social movement, but the sort of environmentalist grassroots stories of the year? You did mention um, the coal plants, but but anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, well, I think that uh, certainly in, it's the grassroots movements that are going to, in many ways, be the, the front lines for a lot of these things. Um, you know, Keystone was largely, even though the jury saw it on that, um, um, it was the the rally that they had in Washington, where Bill McKibben and Michael Broom, the Sierra Club, and many others got arrested on the steps of the of the White House. But beyond that, from a grassroots perspective, you know the the fracking bans that have been imposed by cities throughout Colorado, when the state is even though the state's threatening to sue the cities because the state is pro fracking, and then up in uh, Washington State, you've got these choke points for all the coal that's. Um, being dug out of the ground in the Powder River Basin in Montana and Wyoming and being shipped, uh, being shipped by rail car to the West Coast. Now they're going to try to ship it off to China and Asia. It's the, it's the local governments in, in Bellingham and, and in Washington State and Oregon that are going to create the choke points for that and possibly, um, shut down that those exports you know you talk about the fight in in the west coast uh in in oregon and in washington against the export of of coal and the the coal terminals there and that brings to mind a story that i thought was really huge but it's kind of under the radar which is bay area billionaire tom steyer suddenly becoming a real political force essentially you know buying the governor's mansion uh in, in virginia um, to install uh, Terry McAuliffe, who at least was not a, a you know outright climate change denier, and then playing a very strategic role in uh, making large or significant donations uh, in some of the county races up there in in Whatcom County, Washington, in Bellingham, Washington, where some of these one of the coal ports uh, was proposed for. Which I guess brings to mind these stories that are are really important, but are kind of sleeper stories, and that maybe. Um, kind of slipped underneath the radar. So I'd, I'd like to ask each of you, and, and we'll start with you, Kira, what are some of the stories that, you know, were really big but really just didn't get that much attention? Um, well, you know, in a way, um, one of the really big stories of the year was um, the uh, increasing um, extreme weather events. You know, we had um, the Yosemite Rim Fire, and um, we had the Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Um, and all of these are really uh, part of a larger pattern that um, there's more and more scientific research coming together um, showing that these things really are um, part of a larger pattern and, and um, becoming more frequent and more intense. So um, I would say that kind of uh, the year in extreme weather and these these increasingly high-profile events um, and the connections between them are, are really um, one of the most underreported stories of the year. Brian, what about you? I guess I would say, you know, along the, the same lines, I mean, in terms of things that haven't been got the attention they deserve, I mean, 
we, I, I think there's a, there's a real problem with also the adaptation you need to do to those extreme weather events. Um, we saw in, in 2012 Hurricane Sa- Superstorm Sandy, you know, showing just how da- how damaging um, a major storm hitting a major urban center in the U.S. can be. But our memories are short, you know, and, and even though we have, we, we see storms like Super two, Typhoon Haiyan, we see forest fires as well, we see floods, um, I think there still isn't enough being done or even being reported, I think, to explain how big a deal that will be in the future, especially sea level rise. Primarily, there are a few. You know, Mother Jones had a great story. Rolling Stone had a great story about sort of what's going to happen with sea level rise in the future. The Rolling Stone one showcased what would happen in Miami, and I think we need more of that because you know you're talking about cities being essentially destroyed, and you have a lot of infrastructure being built now. If you don't change that before that happens, you know, you're facing uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of damages in the future. You know, it's interesting because this is Steve. Um, I, I, I agree with you both on that, but it, I sometimes find that that is the trickiest story to tell because it's so hard to, to, to show a direct connection between climate change and, say, the, the extreme weather conditions, uh, storms like Superstorm Sandy. Um, and I think that also it, it's the, in some ways, the kind of the least effective argument because the, the climate change deniers seize on that so, um, with with ferocity and I think with some effectiveness. Um, I'd like to hear what you guys think about that. I mean, I can say, you know, I think that that's definitely true, and it, it is tricky. I mean, it is very tricky, especially to ever connect individual weather events now happening today to the, the amount of warming we've already put into the at, into the atmosphere. But at the same time, I mean, it, it almost doesn't matter about climate change when it comes to these kind of events. I mean, you you have more people, more property being put into areas that are just always that are vulnerable. If they're on the coast, they are vulnerable. And so, you know, we know right now we need to better prepare our cities to all kinds of extreme weather because extreme weather has always been happening. It'll continue to happen. But then when you add in something like sea level rise, which is much more so than, than, than hurricanes, I think, and other, other weather events, is very clearly a, a climate issue. You know, we, we can know how right. the, the sea is going to rise in the future much better than we know, for instance, what effect it will have on tornadoes, on, on hurricanes. So we, we know that that's going to be a huge problem going forward. So I think here's something we, we need to deal with. And, again, it's, it's, it's always in the back of our mind, but it's easy to sort of put that in the back burner. You know, there's always things that are more important to deal with right now. Uh, but then a storm comes along, and if it hits uh, in New York City or Miami in the future when the seas have risen, the damage will make Sandy look like nothing. This is Nell Greenberg, and you're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environment radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Today we're reflecting on the top and untold stories of 2013 with Brian Walsh of Time Magazine, Kira Butler of Mother Jones, and Steve Hawk of Sierra Magazine. Kira, what do you think about, you sort of started the conversation about making the connections between climate change. What do you think about Steve's question about how relevant that is or not? Well, it, I, I mean, I think it's really, really relevant. You know, if you if you can't make people understand that all of these things that we're noticing are connected and that humans actually influence that, then um, there's not going to be any political impetus to change. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and, 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 and folks are talking about the importance of adaptation. I thought two important stories that came out this year, one in Mother Jones, which was um, pointing, I think it was via your climate desk coverage, looking at how Monsanto is already sort of setting up a business model that can actually thrive in an atmosphere of more extreme weather. And then a piece, I think it was in the New York Times about how some major companies, Fortune 500 companies, are already quietly baking in um, an eventual price on carbon into their long-term financial model. So I'm wondering, um, Brian, any corporate stories that you thought were sort of big corporate uh, environmental trends that you saw? Well, I think you put your finger on it right, right there. I mean, underneath the surface of the sort of back and forth we see with politics and, and the real problem we have getting, I think, a consensus on anything, I mean, climate change really, you know, being one of those, the corporations are, know this is happening. They also have to operate in different parts of the world. And they have to operate in places like Europe where climate politics are a lot more advanced. So they need to deal with the carbon price right now. They need to deal with the carbon price coming down the line in California as well. And so I think although that's not something they often talk about. It's not something we report on as much as we can. They're getting ready because, I mean, they're, they're not dealing with, 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 with deniers. I mean, that's not something that matters to them. 
they need to get those companies in in place, I think, to get ready for a warmer world. And all that's going to mean, both in terms of dealing with how we might choose to answer that politically, but also in terms of how that will literally change everything about doing business. That's a really good point, I think. You know, the fact that the business community is preparing for it, that the actuaries and all the insurance companies are preparing for rising sea levels, that tells you that it, as much as anything, how, how real the threat is. So sort of in another business angle, I'm curious about your business, the business of environmental reporting. And we had a couple shifts in this year. The New York Times, of course, closed their, dismantled their environmental desk and shut down its green blog. On the other side, uh, Inside Climate News won a Pulitzer Prize. So I'm curious, you know, Kira, maybe you can start. Of course, you know, in order to tell the untold stories of environmental journalism, you need environmental journalists. And how's that going? Well, uh, I'm just speaking from the perspective of Mother Jones. Um, you know, we've actually been adding to our climate desk. Um, we have new reporters at our climate desk. We're, you know, pouring more resources into our climate desk because we think this is so important. Um, you know, part of telling these stories well depends on being able to do the kind of reporting that makes people interested. Um, you know, we have to uh, figure out how to put a human face on these issues because, you know, sometimes the um, nitty-gritty of the political fight is not kind of the strongest and most compelling ways to tell these stories. So kind of to get back to the New York Times um, shutting down its desk, it's, you know, it, the fewer reporters that are out there on the ground um, telling these stories in, in a way that engages people, um, kind of the, the less people will know and the less people will care. And that's really sad. Brian Walter Time Magazine. I'm curious from your from your perch there in Manhattan, which is you know certainly where uh, the center of U.S. media. Um, how how are you feeling about sort of the state of environmental journalism and, and whether there are enough reporters out there on the beat to to to, um, to inform you know the public about these issues? Um, I don't think so. Although it's it's hard to separate what may be happening in environmental journalism versus what's happening in, in mainstream journalism more broadly, which is facing you know any number of challenges financially. I think um, that's, that's impacting how we do our jobs. Um, so I think you see you know you see different outlets choose to put different emphasis on this. I mean, we still here at Time Magazine have, you know, an environmental reporter, that would be me, um, you know, and who is who is on the website, who is doing, who is blogging, who gets in the magazine, probably not as much as I would like to, and that always depends on, you know, where the news is going as well. Um, but other places, that's not the case. We saw what happened with the Times. It's a very easy example to point to because that was a very good blog. I mean, they've continued doing very good environmental coverage, but still, you know, it, it, it definitely feels different than it did, say, four, four or five years ago. I remember the Copenhagen Summit maybe being the top of that. And while there have been so many great organizations that have risen in this new media, I mean, you mentioned Inside Climate News, and those were places that didn't exist a few years ago. Um, it, it, I do feel like we're not quite getting enough out there, and I do worry that stories are sort of, are sort of falling through the margins. Steve Hawk, is that what you feel, that there are stories that are falling through the margins? Um, well... Uh, always, um, but uh, I, I actually think that there are, you know, largely because of the inter internet and because of organizations like Mother Jones that are committed to good journalism without the profit motive in mind. Um, and to me, that's where the hope lies. Uh, that there are uh, those stories are out there, and there's a need for them to be told, and people are hungry to hear them, um, and they're hungry for the for journalists to, you know, serve as watchdogs. So um, uh, I just have a sense that it's really good environmental journalism is not going to go away. And I'm, you know, there's the stories that you all think are interesting and that you want to report on, but in the age of the Internet, we can actually see what our audiences think are interesting. And Kira, I know that Mother Jones does a lot of audience tracking. So what were the stories that your audience actually sort of chimed in the most on or showed the most interest in? Well, it's it's really interesting. You know, it, it often we, since climate change isn't always the best sell for a story, sometimes we try to figure out a way to interest people in a story that without mentioning climate change at first and then, you know, people realize that they actually are interested in the climate angle once they've been drawn in by something else. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of it. Um, kind of, well, not in the realm of climate. Um, we were really um, pleased and surprised at how many people um, 
cared about the GMO labeling fight, um, and particularly the angle of how much money um, industry poured into um, opposing labeling of GMO foods. Um, you know, that was a story that we considered uh, at first to be sort of inside baseball, but people just were, you know, outraged at this, which was kind of fun to see. Mm -hmm. And so this is, we've been talking about the year that was. I'd like to take a little bit of time to sort of, uh, uh, you know, look at our crystal balls, however hazy they might be, and, and, and sort of tell us what you think might be some of the, the, the headlines we can expect in, in, in 2014. What are the big issues that you're tracking and keeping an eye on? So, so Steve Hawk, what are some of the issues there at Sierra Magazine that you all are already, you know, basing your editorial calendar um, around? Well, I, I, I can couple that a little bit with uh, what, what Kira just said, which is, you know, we, our our surveys are showing us that um, our our members, our readers, are uh, they've got the message that climate change is happening and that dirty energy is bad. Um, so they actually want to know what are we going to do about it? How are we going to fix it? What are the solutions? So we're going to be doing a lot more on the solution side of things. But I think we're also, to me, one of the great untold stories is um, what's going on with the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC and their attempts to roll back renewable energy standards to label people who have rooftop solar as free riders on the utilities um, to promote uh, um, extraction of fossil fuels on public lands to fight emission caps. Um, and that is basically the oil and gas industry. And uh, that story to me really needs to be told. Loudly. Brian, real quickly, what are some of the, the uh, stories that you're going to be tracking in 2014? Well, certainly, I mean, the, the sort of forthcoming uh, climate regulations, I mean, the regulations on power plants, that's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal politically as well, as you'll definitely see uh, Republicans and, you know, coal state Democrats pushing back hard on that. Um, it's going to be a very challenging year, I think, for EPA Administrator Gene McCarthy. Um, so there's, that, that's there. And we, we talked, we didn't really mention fracking so much here, but, I mean, that's going to be ongoing. Uh, the Energy Information Administration came out with its sort of projections today, and you're, you know, you're really seeing more oil production happening in the U.S. over the next number of years. Uh, that's going to have a lot of impact on the ground. It's going to have some impact on how we use energy as well. So those are the two things I'll definitely be looking at uh, in the year to come. And then, of course, also the Obama administration is set to make their decision on Keystone, right? Supposedly. <laughs> Supposedly. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm beginning to wonder if that's ever going to happen. <laughs> I'd like to give everybody a chance. So where can we see more of your work here? Where can we find more of your work so people can track the, the reporting you're doing next year? Well, in terms of stories for 2014, um, I think that um, we're doing a lot on meat and um, in the coming year, and uh, we'll be looking at um, antibiotics. That's a big ongoing fight. Um, we'll also be looking at energy use in the developing world, um, and that and many more stories as well. All at MotherJones.com. Um, you can find Brian Walsh's work, uh, really fantastic work at Ecocentric. What exactly is the URL there, Brian? Um, it is ecocentric.blogs.time.com. Um, you can also, Twitter seems to be the way everything gets it, it gets it now. I'm at, at Brian R. Walsh with a Y, Brian. Um, and in terms of what we'll be doing, you know, we'll be looking at, we'll take a look at energy in the United States, domestically and internationally. And we might I have to cut you off there, Brian, unfortunately, because okay. we want to make sure people know where Steve is. Sure. Uh, sierraclub.org slash Sierra. That's where all of our stories are. Everything in our print magazine goes up on the web. Fantastic. Well, I really want to thank Kira Butler for, from Mother Jones, Brian Walsh from Time Magazine, and Steve Hawk uh, from Sierra Magazine. Thanks, as always, to our engineer, Michael Yoshida. This show and others are available at kpfa.org. For your convenience, you can download the podcast. Have a great weekend, and have a happy New Year's. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. to Terra Verde and KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Join us again over lunch between 1 and 2 in the afternoon on Fridays to hear more about the unfolding future of the planet.
I'm Margaret Gomez, and I'll be headlining Bravo's New Year's Eve Comedy Fiesta, taking place this year on Tuesday, December 31st, 9 p.m. We'll be laughing and raising funds to benefit Bravo for Women in the Arts, presenting work by women, people of color, and lesbian artists. You can reserve seats now at bravo.org. This year's show will feature progressive comedians, Dialogues Minarianen, Misha Mosley, Mario Montez, and me, Margaret Gomez. And there's an after-show countdown party, free midnight champagne, and DJ Mark Mark, all walking distance from 24th Street Bar in San Francisco with wheelchair accessibility. That's Bravo's New Year's Eve comedy fiesta. You can reserve your seats now. Information at www.bravo.org or call.